Good afternoon and welcome everyone to Diana Initiative's uh, track one. Uh, we'll have Audrey Long uh, speaking on regards to keep your enemies close and your secrets closer. Uh, she's a senior security software engineer over at uh, Microsoft and works on some of uh, Microsoft's uh, toughest challenges for their customers and such. Uh, before we get started, I had a few uh, quick announcements. Just wanted to make folks aware that there is both a soldering and maker space, along with a lock picking village. Uh, if you have any interest in those things, please feel free to visit either of them. Uh, the lock picking village is if you go outside the door, it's immediately on your left hand side at the end of the hallway. And our soldering uh, village is located right near um, registration and such. Also wanted to thank a few of our uh, sponsors. Um, so for today, uh, we have Microsoft, Target, Intel Security, Cybersecurity uh, Service, along with AWS, Recorded Futures, uh, Toyota, and Amazon, all sponsoring uh, this particular track. Um, if you can take some time and visit our uh, sponsors outside in the vendor area and everything else, and give them some love and attention, and thank them for supporting Dyn Initiative, that'd be super appreciated. And without any further ado, uh, here you go, Audrey. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone to attend my talk. Uh, you know, I'm Audrey, I'm super humbled and honored to be here today. The Diane Initiative is really interesting and you know, honestly, it's cool to see there's, there's so much diversity and inclusion that's trying to be spread throughout not only this, the tech industry, but the security industry as well. All right. Oh, it's not working. I'm not sure why. There we go. All right, so a little bit about me. Um, so I am a senior security software engineer at Microsoft. I work in an organization called MCAPS, which we work with um, some of the world's largest Fortune 500 companies to help them migrate their code and any kind of tough technical problems they have onto Azure. So I have kind of a long list of you know, cyber responsibilities. Some include application software engineer, security engineer, security architecture, you name it, I'm there for you whatever kind of needs that you have, I'm here to help. Besides that, I have my Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Science from the University of Cincinnati, it's in Ohio. Uh, it's a great little school and I really loved going there. I just graduated recently with my Master's of Science degree in Cybersecurity from the Johns Hopkins University. Um, I'm also a Diversity and Inclusion Ambassador at Microsoft, so I really love being included in some of these events where I get to come and just come up here and talk about what I do at my job, uh, what I think is really impactful, and how I like to move my career and other careers forward. Aside from that, some fun facts about me. I'm a moderator for Korean food subreddit. Um, I definitely think a hot dog should be classified as a sandwich. Let's look at the sandwich alignment chart now. And uh, for in my spare time, I like to play PC games. All right, so let's talk about why we're here. So today we're gonna be talking about security tooling. This slide demonstrates some of the repercussions of not practicing good security hygiene. Data breaches are unfortunately not uncommon. Around 30,000 data breaches happen on websites per day. That's a lot. <laughs> data breaches can have a significant effect on both a company's image and their customer's welfare. Many of these are easily preventable though by introducing secure code hygiene into pipelines. And it's a serious issue. There's about $6 trillion worldwide that was um, definitely reported against in 2021. And we can use easy to open source tooling such as credential scanning to even prevent some of these from happening. So strange. Sorry. I don't know why this isn't working. Oh, there we go. Cool, thank you. Sorry about that, guys. All right, so why is this important to my team? So my organization is comprised of many software engineers compared to security engineers. I'm sure this isn't news to most, many of you. Um, we generally, as security engineers, try to herd the cats in OA of trying to get all the software engineers to align to our security hygiene, best practices, and to make sure that they have security in mind when they're doing coding. However, both software and security need to have a common understanding of each industry's best practices. Not only do software engineers need to have a better understanding on security best practices, but us as security engineers also need to have a better understanding on software engineering best practices. 
This will lead to an easy to understand tooling that we can generate as security engineers for our software engineers. And it'll also glean significant insights for us as security engineers to really understand what are some of the avenues that are being exploited today? How are you know, some of these adversaries actually getting into our code base? I feel like there's a common ground that we really need to cover both as software and security engineering. And just for your awareness, th there is tooling that also could be easy to understand for developers. And some of that tooling also should be modular. So what I'm gonna talk to you about today is how I, my team and I generated a secure harness where we can drag and drop any kind of command line scanning tools. And I'm not here to sell you a product. I'm here to just spread an idea that we as security engineers, once we align to the software engineering spectrum, then we can actually achieve more and set aside more time for us as security engineers to really dive deep into some of those harder problems. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about so, some common security missteps. So my organization, oh wait, sorry. This is not going. Okay, cool. So let's talk about some common security missteps. Stored test passwords can allow for an adversary to glean significant information on password structure and requirements. A lot of the times these scanning tools will find these in the code base and us as developers will just ignore them. Like, oh, you know, it's just a test password. It really doesn't matter. However, sometimes it does. <laughs> sometimes we just use the, the exact password structure as is and change around just a few values just for testing. Um, not only that, but we store our repositories out in the open. Um, not, not all of our you know, repositories are public, most of them are private. However, the ones that are public and open source and available for everyone to use, not only gives more insights to people to use our software, but it gives adversaries more insights to glean significant information on how to exploit our systems further. And also gives the you know, adversaries like the SBOM um, talk that you guys hopefully went to earlier, um, to get more information about what types of um, you know, libraries are being used in our code. So also trying to tack on security at the end of the project is very common. However, we need to mo be more vigilant about incorporating security into the requirements phase. So we need to shift left both in the requirements phase from security and also shift left into the software space to, be, to understand the developing problems a little bit more better. All right, so how do we improve the security of our applications? One of the best things that we can do is adopt an adversarial mindset. This can help tease out prime attack vectors and entry points into our applications and systems. We can build countermeasures and develop better mitigation strategies to address these identified risks by utilizing tools and methodologies such as threat modeling. And I know that tonight there's gonna be a great session on threat modeling. I really advise everyone to go to that as well. We could also implement security tooling available to us to remove those easy to access secrets and make it easier for developers to use our code. A lot of the times, us as security engineers, we tell our software developers to go make this more secure. You can go follow this you know, integration document. However, if we're not doing these practices and we're actually not going and doing these configurations, who, who, who's gonna actually benefit from this? Nobody. And too many times I've seen this happen where us as security engineers just kind of give more work to these developers instead of sitting with them and helping, it, helping the developers move along and making these processes easier for them. All right. Now let's talk a little bit more about the intersection between software and security. So apparently my, my slides are not func properly um, cooperating with me, so I'm just gonna go off, go off of this. <laughs> All right, so like I was saying, not only do we have to shift security to the left in regards to the requirement space, but also in understanding how the software works. And one of the things we can do for that is by just practicing DevSecOps. So many of you might be wondering what it is DevSecOps. So DevOps is one of the core 
software engineering practices where development happens, where we put bake in all of these tooling at the beginning of the process, and then we have operations that are observing all of the processes as we go along. Uh, and security wraps around all of that as a whole so that we as security engineers can glean insights both from the development and the operations standpoint. When we have this type of infrastructure, we start to get into the right direction on introducing more software practices to security engineers. So shifting left, like I said, not only in the requirements phase, but as software developers as well. And since we have development experience to understand these attack vectors, we can come up with better mitigation strategies. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> All right, so now that DevSecOps we know is a step in the right direction to bridge the gap between security and software, we know that more needs to happen. Is there one tool to rule all security scanning in a project? Uh, sure. <laughs> Ain't that a problem? <laughs> no, there's not one tool to rule them all. Unfortunately, there's not. So uh, there are many security tools that are actually needed in order to make sure that we have secure code. We need static code analysis, dynamic code analysis, infrastructure's code, credential scanning, container scanning, open source scanning, the list goes on and on and on. And in this instance, um, what I'm gonna be talking to you guys about is how I created a credential scanner and I decided to wrap an open source scanner. It's made by Yelp, it's called Detect Secrets, and I wrapped this open source tool to integrate with Azure DevOps. Now, like I said before, I'm not trying to sell you a tool, I'm really trying to sell you an idea. So why is this important for my team? Uh, it was important because we needed some kind of a credential scanner available for my developers to use uh, on Azure DevOps platform. You know, a lot of us have our repositories in GitHub and we have the advanced security settings that are available to us, really easy to integrate. However, that's not the case with Something, some platforms, uh, Azure DevOps is one of them, and I'm sure there's many others out there that many of us, com our companies have that are probably in-house or a, a little uncommon too. So you, running into this problem is probably something that lots of people have, have come across. So not only though, is it important to find the proper tools for the job, but understanding the tooling capabilities and configuring them properly in the code base is another important factor. There's too many times where I've seen a security engineer just unbox a tool and just let the default configuration do the job. That's not enough and that's not good enough for security. You really need to understand what this tool is doing in your infrastructure, in your code, and what kind of glean insights you can grab from that. Okay. so. Here is the reusable architecture that I'm gonna be talking to you about in the next few slides. I won't spend a lot of time on this, um, but I do wanna kind of point out what we're doing here. So in order to make some, a scalable harness for any kind of a command line drag and drop tool, the first thing you need to do is understand and research the tooling. So there are so many tools out there just for a credential scanner. I know I personally had to go through six or seven different tools and really kind of do a comparison on which tooling was the best and which one actually found more in insightful secrets and which one found more false positives. And this is really important to, too, doing this research as a security engineer, because we all know there are so many tools out there and a lot of them are not very good, <laughs> just being honest with you. Um, and then after we find the tool for the job, we need to really understand the configuration file and how we actually run that tool on the command line. Um, by doing that, we can find what kind of input parameters actually work best for us. Which input parameters are actually gonna give us the most significant insight. Then after we figure out how to parameterize the tool, figuring out how to execute a CLI tool in, in an environment or infrastructure such as Azure DevOps, then ingest those scanning results into an easy to use report so that we can actually see what this looks like in a really nice dashboard. And that's really important too because a lot of the times when we go through these tool sets and you have a report that gets spit out on the CLI, sometimes it's a lot to look at. Sometimes it's hard to ingest. So having some kind of a format where we can easily see these results also leads to more people paying attention to what actually is going on. And in my case, the most important thing about this reusable architecture is the backlog integration. 
and I'll show you this in a few slides from now, but anytime in my tool, when a, a something significant gets found, you have the option to just put that as a backlog item. You know, in a perfect world, we'll have security and software engineers looking through these, you know, reports and be like, oh, there's a secret that was discovered here. I'm gonna go work on it right away. Or, oh, maybe it was just a, in a test, you know, password instance, like I mentioned earlier. And they'll just like say, oh, we're just gonna like bypass it and then we're gonna go on. Well, this gives you the option to keep that into the backlog so that we won't forget about it. Because a lot of the times, you know, development happens fast. We need to make sure that we have some kind of a record to, to indicate when these detections actually happened. Okay, now here's a little bit about what the tool looks like. As you can see here, in the top left-hand corner, we have what this, the credential scanner actually looks like in the Azure DevOps pipeline. Um, for this case, I'm using this open source tool called WebGoat. I would highly encourage everyone to take a look at this tool. It's a, a vulnerable tool by design made by the OWASP Foundation, which contains lots of really interesting security, you know, misconfigurations and, you know, bad libraries. And for tooling research, it's important to have like one baseline, like one bad application where we can test all of these tools to see what's actually good, what, what doesn't work, what worked well. Um, so having something like OWASP WebGoat, um, I definitely recommend anyone who's doing any other kind of research like this to, to investigate. Um, what I really wanted to point out though is to the right hand corner, I have this little box around the, the detect secrets parameter. So what I did is when I wrapped this tool for Azure DevOps, I made all of these configurations available for my developers because I wanted my developers to really be empowered to configure the tool the way that works best for them. And we can do that by excluding files, by making sure we're going to a specific directory. You know, those seem like easy wins to me. And I don't know why we don't consider that when we actually give this tooling available to our developers. Um, but the thing that I really want to point out is the, the language here. We have something called a word list. Too many times have I seen in our security communities, we use the words whitelist and blacklist all the time. Whitelist is good, blacklist is bad. However, it's not very inclusive, is it? And we really need to start changing that language. What we like to use in Microsoft is the terms allow list and disallow list, or in the term of Yelp, they like to use the word word list. <laughs> so that's something that I hope that everyone can kind of take away from this talk, is that if we wanna start moving away and becoming more inclusive with our language, it starts with us. It starts with those understanding of, oh, actually maybe why do we say whitelist and blacklist? Why can't we move on to different language that even makes more sense? So that's something I wanted to point out here. And here is another example of what the scanning report looks like. So, you know, OWASP WebGoat apparently has 152 secrets within their code base, which is great. And this is what the, the scan report looks like after I took the scanning result from the CLI, you know, made it in a really nice format that's easily ingestible into Azure DevOps and have the ability to right then and there to actually hit that little create a bug icon to then just put that bug right into the Azure DevOps backlog. And this, in my opinion, is something that we could all learn from. We can, we as security engineers can make this. You know, I made this for my customer. I did this in a week. And then, you know, spent more engineering time and effort to make it more of a reusable tool that can be used throughout my organization. But, you know, a lot of the times as security engineers, I feel like we don't go that far. But we should. Let's talk a little bit about the future state of security. So smarter secrets detection and the use of more advanced scanning methods and algorithms and security research will progress throughout the years. Advanced entropy engines to get better generate strings which closely resembles the secrets, the connection strings, the keys that we see today, um, they're eventually going to be um, more integrated and there's gonna be better security tooling out there to actually determine that that is a secret and that is a key and that is important. Um, because a lot of the time what I see is um, some of these algorithms that are out there, they still miss some stuff, and it's, it's quite unfortunate. Uh, we need to have more research and engineering effort into making these tools. Machine learning models are also, you know, hot topics that we hear about today in software engineering, and they can significantly reduce the number of false positives detected. And simple models like this exist today. However, 
more advanced detection models will be generated in the future, which will really help our jobs to determine false positives. Another thing is secure code by pipeline. Secure code by default. This is really what we should strive to do as security engineers as well. These 100, 200 level items of making sure we have secure scanning in your pipeline, when, when can we move away from that? Why haven't we been moving away from that now? And how can we make sure that developers start doing this just inherently so that we can focus on the harder security problems? Let's talk a little bit about the evolution. So software and security need to continue to become a union, both on the development side of the house and the security side. There needs to be in better integration between software and security at all levels of development. The security landscape is always changing, and as such, we need to be dynamic in our security practices. We need to develop scalable, secure practices, solutions, and tooling to generate more secure standards across every industry. Another thing that we do poorly as a security community is we, our findings are siloed away from each other. We need to do a better job at spreading the wealth of information throughout each industry. Uh, within our companies, outside our companies, uh, at conferences like this. As we all know, knowledge is power, especially when we have a common enemy that we're dealing with, especially in regards to threats. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you everybody for, for listening. And I'm sorry I've had so many technical problems. It's very, very stressful. <laughs> Thank you. Here's my LinkedIn. You guys can follow me on LinkedIn. And I'm open for any questions now. Thank you so much for shading light on some of the advanced tooling techniques as well as talking about the security culture of bringing security towards left. I, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Uh, my question is mainly around uh, false positives. You know, whether you opt for commercial uh, secret scanning tools or open source, they all sort of uh, operate on regex or allow list or whitelist. So what are some of the machine learning techniques that you personally use to improve that false positive rate? Yeah, so right now, we actually haven't included any machine learning models into this tool. The only thing that we've used is the Yelp Detect Secrets uh, default scanner, which is using something called Shannon Entropy to go through and make sure that there's better regex matching to compared to the strings. And that's actually a big reason why we decided to choose this open source tool. Um, because this Shannon Entropy model did an excellent job actually at finding more of those like really strange connection string, very strange key-like secrets within the code base. And I, I really do hope that you know in the future, if more time is allocated, we can actually do some of those machine learning models and impl implement more of our own tooling and false positives. Because you're right, you know, a lot of credential scanners, uh, secret, you know, uh, static code analysis scanners. There's so many false positives. And we need to have better tooling out there to really kind of get those out of our way so we can look at the things that are really important. So entropy analysis definitely sounds super promising, mm -hmm. but like, have you already researched some of the ML techniques which are out there that we can readily use or that is like unknown? Yeah, unfortunately, that's not my wheelhouse. Not yet, okay. at least. Um, yeah, there's definitely some machine learning tools and programs out there that are really good right now, but in the future, there's gonna be some more hardened ones that I, I really hope will be available for everybody soon. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, just FYI, we have about one more minute left for questions or anything else. If you wanna have questions outside or anything else, you can totally do that too if you'd like to. Sure. Hi, so really quick question. Um, speaking of the union between engineering and security, how did you introduce this tool to Azure DevOps so that people like it and they want to use it and how do you follow up with people? Yeah, absolutely. So w what I actually did with this tool is I made a Visual Studio Marketplace extension. So there's actually a Visual Studio Marketplace out there and you can go and you can find all these tools kind of like in Visual Studio Code as well where you can find tools and drag and drop them and they kind of do the, the scanning for you as you go or in a pipeline for this example. Um, so that's kind of the first step, is making something accessible and easy for everybody to use. And then the second step is how do we spread the information? 
Uh, so how we do that in my organization is we have lots of meetings and brown bags and sessions, and we also have the Security Champions Program, which I feel like is pretty common amongst many other companies. And by educating our security champions and anytime we're on an engagement, introducing our customer and the development crews that are on those you know, engagements to see this tool, how does it work? This is what the results will give you. The word of mouth really does start to spread. Um, but that's unfortunately the beginning on how you, you're gonna spread it. Um, hopefully over time, you know, just reviews and usage will actually like tell the tale. Great. And yeah, I'll be, I'll be around. So if anyone has any other questions or wants to talk afterwards, I'm, I'm free to talk. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much, Audrey, for your talk.